Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. And uh, once again, I have this wonderful privilege to join with you to hear a story of how the Holy Spirit worked in someone's life and drew them to a deeper walk with Christ and His church. And our guest tonight is Matt Bantuano and a uh, former evangelical Protestant. Matt, welcome to the program. Great. It's, it's wonderful to have you here. Great to be here. Uh, you're a physics teacher. That's right. And I'm, I'm just tempted to want to talk about all kinds of science and religion stuff, but that yeah. isn't necessarily your journey. Is That's it? right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So let me get out of the way and let me invite you to let's start out on the journey. Sure. Well, I'm from New Jersey, okay. start with. And, um, you know, I always invite people to make all the Jersey jokes they want. Feel free. Uh, <laughs> I remember one time I was on a ride in Disney and there was a little bit of a backup. So the guy there started asking people where they were from. And my dad says, we're from New Jersey. And the guy says, I'm sorry. And my dad says, I said, we're from New Jersey. And the guy said, no, I heard you. I'm just saying, I'm sorry. <laughs> but low. <laughs> that's right, a little blow. Um, but my parents are originally from Rhode Island and they moved to New Jersey for my father's acting career. He, was, he did some Broadway shows. Um, and so it was fun being a kid. Uh, and he also got a job once doing a tour of Europe um, so I was in third grade at the time, nine years old, and visiting a lot of holy places and seeing a lot of really beautiful things hang out backstage. Um, and at the time, I couldn't appreciate what I was seeing. I appreciated it a little bit. And I was raised going to the Catholic Church, and I received all the sacraments of initiation. So we would go to Mass at Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, things like that. Um, just beautiful. And I think a lot of those things came back later when I started to appreciate the beauty but I was wondering with your family coming from Rhode Island, yeah. New Jersey, I mean, those are two traditionally strong Catholic pockets of That's our right. population. So yeah. that was in your background. Then. So it was in my background. Yeah. I received all the sacraments. Um, and we went to church each week. Okay. Uh, when I was in middle school, my parents divorced and my father said he was an atheist. And my mom, uh, we continued to go to church, um, but my mom kind of got connected to another some friends brought her on a retreat for, I think it was a Protestant church, I'm not 100% sure. And um, so I was just nominally Catholic. So your dad, let's go back a little bit then. So your dad, sure. your parents were Catholic, uh, but, but your dad really was not a believer. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly. He says he was, but right. yeah. you know, it's hard yeah. To, yeah. to probe that area. I mean, there's an example of you can, you can look like it and you can walk the talk but really not believe it in your heart, possibly. Right? Possibly, yeah. So right. that, that had influence on you and as a young man, and really catching yeah. it early then. Right, yeah, and I didn't, there was not a lot of instruction. I was sacramentalized, yeah. but I certainly was not well catechized. In fact, I, I have a memory in college, I actually went to Mass a couple times in college my freshman year, <laughs> and I was going with one of my teammates, I played rugby, and I remember asking them about, you know, what do you think about these other Christian groups? Because we were in Virginia, a lot of Protestants there, and that's where I came alive in my faith. Um, but I asked him once, I said, what's one of the differences, some of the differences between us and the Protestants? And he's like, oh, the Protestants believe that Jesus is God. We're Catholic, we don't believe that. And I didn't know the difference. I mean, now looking back, I'm like, that's crazy. But sad. I didn't know the difference at the time. Sad. That'd be an interesting long reflection on that. Sad. <laughs> Yeah, that where he would ever got that idea, but but there you are. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he had that idea, and I I didn't know. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but I went to I went to college, and uh, joined the rugby team, and in college I got the nickname Tank Top, the because everyone gets a nickname. It's like a fraternity, right? The rugby team, just less cologne and more dirt. And, uh, you know, my sister called up the house where I lived one time and asked for Matt, and they said, "Who?" She's like. <laughs> Is tank top there? I'm like, yeah, you know, because I was from New Jersey and I wanted to show off. So the first three weeks of college, I wore tank tops and I got the nickname. Oh, okay. Um, but so my freshman year of college, I just kind of went crazy. I got involved in the party scene, and the rugby team knows how to party. Um, but at the very end of that year, I felt that things weren't quite right. So there's got to be more than this. Hmm. I was going to the parties, drinking a lot, and I didn't even like the taste of the beer. So I'm like, what am I doing? So I started questioning things. That summer I was playing rugby at something called the uh, World Scholar Athlete Games in Rhode Island. And I met a kid there from the Kingdom of Tonga. And he would talk about faith a little bit. I didn't really know what he was talking about. 
but on the bus. Kingdom of Tonga. Kingdom of Tonga, yeah. Where is that? I mean, <laughs> it's right along the uh, international date line. It's actually the first country that gets the new year okay. each year. Okay. Um, and we've we kept in touch a little bit. Uh, his name was Shione. Shione Tukia Motuapuaka was his name. <laughs> Actually, I remember it. And the last day of the games, he's on the bus head, getting ready to head back to the airport. So I see him, and he reaches his hand out, and I reach my hand up, and he says, I'll see you in heaven. And I thought, now i got to go to heaven. I got... And so, but I was thinking, I was reading books and stuff. I was working as a deckhand on the Block Island Ferry. Um, and got back to school, and I said, I'm going to find out more about this Christian thing. But there, the big ministries on campus were, by default, Protestant, right. so evangelical, interdenominational. Right. And I went to the big group meeting, and I met someone there, and I said, hey, do you run a Bible study for sophomores? Because I sort of picked up that they run these Bible studies by class. And he said, I run a Bible study for sophomores. So I said, great. So I went, and we read Romans 8, talking about crying out, Abba, Father, the Holy Spirit. And I said, I want that. And I embraced the faith. Right, I'm a sophomore in college at the time um, of a physics major, and I just dove into Scripture. I loved it, dove into reading the Bible, um, started reading books, and then just a few months after that, I met my wife, Emily. And, uh, and that was, you know, we met at a, a gathering for our Christian group. She's also from New Jersey, so of course we had to go down to Virginia to, to meet. Um, and of course I introduced myself as Tank Top, and she says, I don't think I can call you that. <laughs> so, you know, she had a nickname for me. She called me that. Um, so you're you're involved in this non-denominational Bible study. Are you going right. to church at all anywhere? Or you're just really involved with this fellowship. I just I started following along with whatever the people in the fellowship right. did, and most of them went to a Presbyterian church just yeah. off campus. So I just went along. Whatever they did, I did. The big group meetings, the the Bible studies that particular church, the prayer groups, I just yeah. dove headlong in. And I stayed as a member in good standing on the rugby team. And <laughs> that was confusing for the rugby team members. Um, I had, even actually before I sort of embraced the faith in this personal relationship with Christ, I decided I was gonna stop drinking because it was kind of an all or nothing thing. And I remember uh, I went with one of the guys during a party. I would still go to the parties and hang out. I would just have a bottle of Gatorade with me. One of the guys was confused we're on our way to pick up the keg. They needed someone sober to go with the guy to pick up the keg. So I went, and he says to me, Matt, what happened? Like, was there, did you get into a big car accident or something? Do you just, you know, you're different. And so trying to explain to them was not always easy right. what, what the difference was. Um, well, you, you point out something that I found in those days when I was involved with those non-denominational groups. I, I worked with Young Life, uh, for example, yeah. in varsity. Um, that the the goal and the policy of the non-denominational outreaches was not to pull people from their Christian tradition. That wasn't their goal. They were right. just trying to emphasize a deeper walk with Christ. Right. Absolutely. But what often happened was those that then had a reawakening of faith would often follow the leaders right. to where they went. And that sounds like what happened to you. Right. Yeah. And I was reading the Bible. So I picked up the Bible and I read it. And I found that I knew a lot of the stories. Yeah. And then I was putting them together in context. And then I was hearing almost like in a cartoon kind of way what Catholics believed. You know, the saints. And I'm reading the Bible like, I don't see this in the Bible that kind of thing, right? And again, because what was happening was I was immersed in this culture. And in terms of developing a relationship with Christ, it was beautiful and a love for Scripture, right. you know, to bring that into the Catholic Church. But there, to have that, it was wonderful. But at the same time, it was from a certain perspective, you know, reading it through the lens of Protestantism. And it was so strong for me um, that later when I started to learn about Catholicism, at first I was really, really uh, I, I'm guessing life. that in general, your meetings with that non-denominational group that was emphasizing Scripture and Christ, they probably were not overtly anti-Catholic, but it would just come right. out. Yes. And sometimes by emphasizing authority of Scripture versus the authority of, of a tradition or something, that might be the subtle way that it would right. would start undercutting your childhood faith. Absolutely, yeah. And I've I've found since then that what it creates is this sort of subconscious objection. And those subconscious objections and biases are so strong in us because we don't realize they're there. If it's a, if it's a conscious objection, 
you can look at it and say, okay, what's the evidence for it? What's the logic? Yeah. But when it's under the surface, it's, it's hard to even see it. Yeah. You know, it's an assumption. Yeah. As, a, as a physics teacher, that's one of the things we try to tell our students is what are your assumptions when you perform an experiment? Same kind of thing. When I look at scripture or anything like that, to see my assumptions is the hardest thing. Yeah. You know, Socrates talks about um, he feels like he's having to box with shadows in his defense speech. Right? And it was that same kind of thing, I think, for a lot of people who are mm -hmm. trying to investigate Catholicism. So that was building up in you. Had, right. Had, did you quit going to Mass during all that period? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so my uh, Emily, the girl I had met, uh, we got engaged. And short, I got engaged shortly after coming back from a missions trip to Central Asia. Great time, six weeks, um, just immersed in scripture and in fellowship and then trying to share the gospel there. Came home, asked her to marry me. She said yes. So our senior year, we're preparing to get married. And um, we'll step back a bit. Probably the, one of the first things that was like a tap on the shoulder for Catholicism, <laughs> the summer after I began a relationship with Christ. So my summer after my sophomore year, I'm working as a deckhand on the Block Island Ferry, and I'm reading tons of scripture, uh, and I'm reading books, and one of them is the Confessions of St. Augustine. And there are these scripture references. I'm like, oh, wow, that's a great verse. And I'm looking at my Bible, I'm like, where is WIS, like W-I-S, what is that, or, you know, S I don't, what are these books that he's referring to? Because that's, you know, is that, is that another name for Proverbs? And I found out later, like, oh, those are the, you know, apocryphal books. Yeah. And I just sort of dismissed it. If I thought more about it, it would have bothered me. Um, so then one of the other taps on the shoulder was uh, middle of my senior year. I'm a leader in the ministry, and so my email is on the website. And I get this email from a guy, and he's a Catholic. And he simply asks, why don't you follow the traditions of the church as Scripture teaches? And he quotes a verse from Scripture that says, follow the traditions yep. that I've handed to you. And immediately I pick up, I'm like, oh, I got defensive. And so we started emailing back and forth. We sent over more than a year, we sent over 40 emails, very lengthy emails. And I'm not one to back down from a debate. So we just kept going. The problem was, though, my Protestant lenses were on so strong that you, it just had to say the word work, works, or something like that. And I'd flare up, oh, it's not sola fide. You know, it's not scripture alone. It's not faith alone, any of those things. Um, and so I just, even the things that he was presenting, I couldn't see past them. A couple of things caught me, though. Uh, we were talking about the canon. Where did the canon come from? And I said, all, all the Old Testament scriptures are quoted in the New Testament. And he called me out on it. He said, no, they're not. You know, even the Protestant Old Testament, not all those scriptures are quoted in the New Testament. Right. I said, okay, got me there. And then another time he quoted an early church father, Irenaeus, about the Eucharist, the nature of the Eucharist. And I read it, and he's, it's pretty clear he's saying that the Eucharist is the body and blood of Christ. So I went to one of my mentors at the time. And so we graduated, and at this time now, my wife and I are working with her father, who is the area director for a ministry in the New York, New Jersey area, to uh, ministering to athletes. And so we were helping him administratively. He works with a couple of professional teams in the New York, New Jersey area. And then we were at Rutgers University working with athletes there, running Bible studies, sharing the gospel, that kind of thing. So you're not only uh, you have been drawn into the non-Catholic Christian world, but you're in full-time right. ministry uh, yep. with your uh, wife's father. That's right. right. Right, which makes it tough. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> thankfully, he's a he's a great guy, and we got along. I mean, I don't mean tough really at the well. time, but later on, when you if you had to move. Yeah. And again, our guest is uh, uh, Matt D'Antuano. Um, yeah. All right, so. Uh, wow, so you're, you're yeah. in both feet in ministry. That's right, yep. Um, and, and we loved it, being, giving full-time service to the Lord. Um, Pulling Catholics out of the church. Yeah, that's right, you know, I mean, trying to. Yeah. Because at that time, because of my lens and what I was communicating with this guy, um, it looked like heresy to me. So I was really anti-Catholic. The guy that I was emailing with, by the way, his name is Trent Beatty, and he actually writes and does interviews now for Catholic publications. He put out a book, Fit for Heaven, which is his interviews with professional athletes. 
Um, so I like to think that I helped to hone his writing skills <laughs> and his patience a little bit as well. But he, he gave me this quote about the Eucharist. And so I went to one of my mentors, um, someone I knew in the ministry, and I said, look at this quote. Is this interesting? And he said, well, the church fathers speak so symbolically, we can't really take them seriously, mm -hmm. like take them literally. And I was like, okay, so that helped to quell whatever thoughts I had. The door opened for me though, in the spring of that year. So this is 2005 now, I'm still doing ministry. My father-in-law signs up, um, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, and me and Emily to go and audit a class at the King's College in New York City. There's a class on the philosophy of Tolkien and Lewis taught by Peter Kraft. <laughs> and it's in the evening, yeah. so we're gonna go. <laughs> you know? And so it was funny because we were taking bets on the way to the first class. Is it Kraft or is it Kreft? <laughs> and so I, don't, I still forget how, but yeah. we, we got a hold of him and we, we invited him out to dinner before the first class. He's like, sure. So he came out with us and we're having dinner with him. And we asked him and he says, actually it's Kraft. So, you know, who would have thought? No one gets it right. Yeah, no one gets it right. Just like my name, right? Um, so I can sympathize with that. But I knew, I knew that Kraft had been a convert, that he had come from Protestantism to Catholicism. I had read the book um, Case for Faith, and one of the interviews in there is with Peter Kraft. Yeah. So I knew he was well respected. So I just asked him, point blank, what do you think about Catholicism and being saved by faith and that kind of thing? And he helped me to pull back a little bit and see that the way that I was using the words uh, made a difference. That words can have different senses. Like faith can be just um, kind of intellectual assent, kind of agreeing to something. Right. Or it can mean, you know, complete trust. Trusting in something. Your whole life, everything you know, whole heart, about everything. You, everything about and so when Protestants say faith, that's usually what they mean. And being saved often Protestants mean something like being forgiven, forgiven for our sins, whereas Catholics often mean complete and total sanctification. And I said, okay, so maybe they're not completely heretical. So I pulled back. All of a sudden, I didn't think Catholics were heretical anymore. Um, and it was fun getting to take that class with Kraft and read C.S. Lewis at the same time. Um, and, you know, Kraft was wonderful because the class was was about Lewis and was about Tolkien and he would bring out the elements of the faith and we would see kind of his perspective on things uh, and it was fun just getting to know him anyway uh, he would come down from Boston spend the whole day and so we'd catch up with him before class and uh, he loved to do two things play chess and ping pong in the student center there uh, we were, I remember one time I was playing him in chess and my father-in-law was playing him in chess at the same time so he's playing both of us, and he's reading a paper, and he's beating both of us. That's not saying much for me. I don't play chess much. And he beat both of us at the same time. Another time he walked into class and he had been playing, you could tell he'd been playing an intense match of ping pong, and his tie is, is off and he's, he's just trying to get it on, and we're just laughing at him because he's not, he doesn't have a mirror to see standing up in front of the classroom. Finally he just rips it off and he throws it down, you know, and he says, the ping pong is so intense here. Um, but so it was, he opened the door for me, at least it's not heretical. And then it was in reading Lewis and then reading Chesterton, thinking maybe there's a little bit more to this. And then I started reading some philosophy as well, because they, they each kind of point to that, um, Plato and Aristotle. You know what I think of Kraft? Kraft. 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 Um, and how his influence was to, to open a little crack in the door. It just shows you how a trustworthy witness, a trustworthy, faithful witness of Christ can break through some of the craziness, right. the walls, yeah. where a lot of voices coming at you, no, I'm seeing it through this lens, but then you get somebody saying, no, this guy's a trustworthy person. Yeah. It's a deep believer, I see it in his life. Right. So then that makes it, look, I mean, it speaks to our need to be trustworthy witnesses. Right if we're gonna break through those subconscious barriers. But that's kind of what Crave did for you. Right, yeah. You know, it's somebody that you can actually see instead of being one of those yeah. Catholics, whoever they are. Yeah. Um, but it was in reading some of those, you know, Lewis, uh, Chesterton, and some philosophy, where I started to think more critically about what is the nature of virtue, what's human nature about, you know, the soul, the body, all these things. And 
I thought to myself well, about purgatory. Um, at first I thought it was just plain silly that there could be anything like purgatory because all of our sins are forgiven. But then I realized this thing about sanctification and building virtue, I realized at the end of my life, I'm not going to be perfectly virtuous. And yet in heaven, I will be. We'll be like God for we will see him as he is. You know, the, the window will be perfectly clean at the time. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe purgatory is possible. Um, you know, and think about the identity of the person. So there's this change. Is that the same person from one to the other? And I'm seeing some passages in Scripture that kind of support that idea, you know, um, being going through the fire, right. refined, that kind of thing. First yeah, Corinthians 3. And I thought to myself, okay, well, maybe it's possible. Not, not probable, but at least it's possible. It's not ruled out. I didn't find anything in Scripture that ruled it out. So I said, okay, maybe there's... Maybe there's something to that. Because sometimes non-Catholic Christians think Catholics see purgatory as a third place or a third option, you right. know, another chance after death, as opposed to, no, it's just the entrance where you get cleaned up with right. left over. Yeah, and that's, that was C.S. Lewis's image that I loved, you know, because I had thought, and again, these like phantom sources that we have, I had this idea that purgatory is a place where we earn the forgiveness for those sins that we didn't confess or something like that. And again, where I got that idea, I don't know. Yeah. But I realize that that's not the case. The view is that it's this being cleaned up, this final purification. And what the nature of it is, we don't know. But we just know that there is this process of purification prior to the beatific vision. And as it says in the verse you were referring to in 1 Corinthians 13, <laughs> It isn't a second chance. A person entering this cleaning phase is saved right. by grace. They've mm -hmm. arrived. Now they just got some stuff to, as you said, uh, the virtues that we didn't attain. They're there to, to be cleaned up. That's right. The vices that are left over. And so, so I'm thinking about that. And now, now I'm more curious. I want to know more about Catholicism. And okay, so Scripture is not necessarily definitive. On this, I'm starting to realize that there are different interpretations of Scripture, and so I'm looking at. So I'm like, well, what? What did the Church Fathers say? And then this question of the Eucharist comes up again, and I'm looking at the Church Fathers, and I'm seeing that they kind of agree about this whole purgatory thing, about the Eucharist, and I'm like, well, these are the guys who are right after the right. apostles. So should I be taking them into account or not? And I was like, well, maybe I shouldn't even be looking at the Church Fathers because I believe in Sola Scriptura. And then it hit me like a ton of bricks. Why Sola Scriptura? Where does that come from? Because I realized, so I looked for arguments. I went back to my apologetics books that I had bought and the theology books. I didn't find any really solid arguments for Sola Scriptura. And certainly none that came from Scripture that were good. I mean, there were some that tried to use the, you know, the Second Timothy passage, all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for right. teaching, rebuking. But it doesn't say only trust in Scripture. In fact, in that same book, Paul writes, the things you have heard me say, hand on. Twice he says that at the beginning of the book. You know, and I, I learned that it's important to take things in context. So a Scripture then, it hit me, was self-refuting. Yeah, it's often circular arguments that are defending sola scriptura, right. but it's also, as you said, self-refuting in mm -hmm. itself. You know, that, that same passage in Second um, Second Timothy that says all the scripture is uh, God-breathed and, and trustworthy, he's writing it to Timothy, and he, just a couple of verses before he says, and these are the, the scriptures that you knew when you were a kid. Right. Well, that's long before the New Testament. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So even the word scripture, does that mean, what exactly does that mean yeah. when it's used in the New Testament? Yeah. Um, and so what happened at this point, I realized that uh, I didn't know where I belonged. You know, having read Lewis and Chesterton and some Plato and Aristotle starting to get some philosophy under my belt, I knew that there was one thing that I had to go after, and that was truth. Hmm. I wanted the truth. So I considered myself something like a denominational agnostic um, because I didn't know which denomination it was, yeah. but I was searching. Yeah. You know, I hadn't pulled back and said, oh, we can't know this. I was still searching for the truth. 
uh, I was still convinced of Christ. The apologetic evidence for Jesus and his divinity still made sense to me. So I hadn't backed away from Christianity, but I was trying to figure things out from that perspective. Catholicism looked like a good candidate, but I still had this objection about Mary. Okay, and so after we take that class in spring, that following year, my wife and I get jobs teaching at a private Christian high school. And it's a Protestant high school. Ironically, it's the same high school that Peter Kraft went to when he was a kid <laughs> in New Jersey. And so I'm teaching math there. Uh, my wife is teaching English. And then the following spring, we audit another class with Kraft. This time, just my father-in-law and I took the class. And so I go to Kraft at one point because my last logical objection to Catholicism is this belief about Mary that she is sinless. And I say, how can you believe that when Scripture clearly says that all men have sinned, that all have sinned? And just very clearly he said, well, um, there's the, you know, the passage, if it says all have sinned, if we take that and we draw a circle and we put into that category all men, and we say everybody in this category has sinned, then we have to put Christ in that category as well, because he was a man. If you don't put him in that category, then you're denying the human nature of Christ. So I said, okay. And if there is an exception for at least Christ, then there's also potentially, potentially an accept, uh, exception for Mary. And so my last argument against Catholicism, in terms of being logically incoherent, went away. I still didn't believe it just, okay, now this is still a good, a good candidate. It's not logically incoherent. Had you at that point then, yeah, because before you had already questioned the issue of it's gotta be in the Bible to be true. Right. Okay, because that, that might have been your comeback. It doesn't say in scripture about right. our, our lady's sinlessness. You might have argued it from there, but, but that argument, since that argument isn't in the Bible, right. it's got to be in the Bible to be in, to be true. That ain't in the Bible itself. So right. they had already opened that door for you. So now you're looking at logic of of, of what he's saying. Let's pause here. Okay, Matt, we'll come back and pick up on that. It's amazing. Just to, I didn't know, but how much Peter Kreeft had a big influence on your life. He did. Yeah, a big influence. Even going to the same school he went to growing up. All right, let's take, take a break, and we'll come back in just a moment. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodai, and our guest tonight is Dan, Matt Dan Twano. Uh, I work real hard. I want to make sure I get your, your fine name correct, uh, former evangelical Protestant. I just want to remind you that, uh, i let you know that his story will be in the Coming Home Network newsletter this February. So if you're interested in reading the whole story, you can go to chnetwork.org and, and get a copy of that newsletter. And also, if you'd like to be in contact with uh, Matt, you can go to his YouTube channel, right? It's called Mr. D418, is That's that right? That's right, yep. Mr. D418. Yeah. All right, Matt, so uh, we've paused you there, and uh, you know, uh, I mentioned just at the break, you know, it's neat to see the witness of, of Dr. Kraft uh, on you, and what I think is particularly unique about that witness is not just because he's this uh, purely intellectual, uh, uh, a brilliant man, which he is, but he's a real guy too. Right. I mean, in some ways, I think that's what impressed you. His yeah. chess and playing ping pong. He is right. a truly uh, real disciple of Jesus Christ. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, at this point, we're teaching at the the Christian school, um, and the door has been opened for me for Catholicism. And so I'm thinking, where do I go from here? Um, I'm trying to figure out scripture, but how do I interpret scripture? Um, it seemed to me that every interpretation, as long as it was logically coherent, 
had to be given the same weight, or at least looked at, you know, looking at things on paper. And that was one of the things I learned from Kraft initially is that I need to go to the source. I can't be looking at Catholicism from the viewpoint of what other people outside have said. You know, I can look at their critiques, but then I go to the Catholic source to see what, what they say. Uh, so I go back again to the church fathers. I'm thinking to myself, okay, it makes sense. What would the people right after have been saying? Uh, and I'm thinking too, well, where did the Bible itself come from? I'm interpreting scripture. I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out what's the right interpretation of scripture. And I realize, well, how do we even know which books are there? Um, if I'm trying, because there's no part of scripture that says, well, you know, here's the manual on how to interpret scripture. Right. So I'm going to the church fathers again, and as I'm looking at the New Testament canon, I think, well, what about the Old Testament canon as well? Because there's that difference. And I find that I'm actually completely reliant on the church fathers, even to know which books belong in scripture. If it wasn't for the church fathers, I wouldn't have the Bible. Right. Like, why not include the letter from Clement? Why not include Barnabas? Why right. not include the Didache? Why include Hebrews? Why do I believe that that book is divinely inspired? And something as, quote, crazy as Revelations. Right. We, you know, I, who would have put that in there? You right. Know, if, uh, it's a tough one. Right. Yeah. And even among the, the very early fathers, there's not always 100% agreement. There, you know, a couple of them kind of disagree. And so I saw the pattern where the church would say, okay, let's come together in a council and figure this out. And what struck me was that I, every time I picked up the New Testament, I was implicitly placing my trust in those church fathers, you know, because the, the New Testament doesn't come down, handed down from, from Jesus. I, I'm implicitly trusting what they have said. Which subtly you're referring to the fact that generally your group of Christians didn't even think about where it came from. Right. You just accepted it as authority. Yeah. Right. And there was a discussion from time to time about that. Well, the church fathers and their scholarship, but it wasn't always referred to the church fathers as having the authority to discern which books belong in scripture. It's just sort of a scholarly exercise. Hmm. And then even interpreting scripture, is that a purely scholarly exercise? Or what's the role of the Holy Spirit? And all these people claim to have the Holy Spirit and in interpreting scripture, but they come up with all these different interpretations. Um, unfortunately, I hadn't exactly been informing my wife of everything that I was discovering. Um, I was doing a lot of reading on my own. And you know, even when I was debating with, with Trent, I would often pray, you know, because my, my head was so big, I would be praying, dear Lord, show one of us the truth. But in my head, I'm thinking to myself, you know, convince Trent that he's wrong, you know. And uh, the Lord answered that prayer. He did show, show one of us the truth. It's just not the one that I was thinking. Um, and I, so when I looked at the New Testament canon, I realized that at the same councils, they also agreed on the Old Testament canon. And it was the Old Testament of the Catholic Church. The one Augustine had been quoting. The one was, Augustine had been quoting, yeah. exactly. You know, and I thought to myself, well, this is interesting because I, I imagined it sort of this way, like imagine that there's a, a witness in court and he's giving some evidence. Um, and it's kind of like taking out some of that evidence and saying, okay, thank you, we're gonna take this evidence but then denying all the rest. Hmm. Because I was, I was accepting what they said about the New Testament. Okay, here's where we get the New Testament scriptures. But then I was implicitly denying all the rest of what they said because I kept finding things like the Mass. You know, I remember reading, at one point, reading one of the Church Fathers or reading the Didache or maybe it was Justin Martyr, whatever the first time I encountered the liturgy was, I said, that's, that's what I said as a kid. That's the Catholic Mass. 2,000 years ago. But again, it was like, okay, well, I'm not convinced yet, you know, so I'm still trying to, sit, sitting back and trying to evaluate all this stuff from trying to be objective in my viewpoint. But I found that if I had to trust them for the New Testament, then it was the Mass. 
it was transubstantiation of the Eucharist, you know. Uh, and that, that had been interesting to me because I realized, you know, I had looked to Scripture to try to disprove that, going back a bit again, and realizing that there was no place in Scripture that says definitely this is symbolic. We had just, we were, most of the arguments for the symbolic presentation of the bread and wine or grape juice, whatever it was, was mostly arguments from reason. But the reason could be worked out. And I realized, okay, it's not in Scripture. So again, it's, we can't get this definitively from Scripture. Looking at the church fathers, there it is. Looking at them for the authority of the church in making decisions about the church and making decisions about doctrine. Even some of them saying, what if there was no Bible? It's a good thing we have the church. Right. Um, and the primacy of Rome, that we are one and connected to Rome. That kept coming up. And I realized, if I, if I accept the New Testament from them, then I really need to accept all of these other things. I can't take one and deny all the rest. Um, or at least you've got to have really good, strong, solid, authoritative reasons to reject all these other things. Right. So where's that coming from? And that's, that's what I found is that I didn't have, because originally I thought, well, the, all of these things, uh, the saints, whatever, that all contradicts Scripture. But it doesn't. It was contradicting my interpretation of Scripture. Looking at Scripture through my lens, yeah. I saw contradictions. But then I, you know, I'm looking at it, and again, this new understanding of what morality means, the role of virtue, um, being sanctified, not, not just merely forgiven, those kinds of things. And then also starting to see the beauty in a lot of these things. One of the little essays that had an influence on me was from C.S. Lewis. He talks about being in a tool shed, and there's a beam of light coming in through the window, and he's, there's a difference between looking at the beam of light in the tool shed versus looking along the beam of light at the sun. And I realized that when it came to the saints, in particular the saints, because that bothered me, I was too busy looking at them and saying, it's not about the saints, it's not about the saints. And if any of the saints were there, they would have said, yep, you're right, it's not, it's not about us, okay. it's about Jesus. You know, it's like condemning the road sign for not being the destination. <laughs> I was saying, like, that's not what it's about. And they're like, that's right, it's, we're not what it's about. We are just reflections of and signs pointing towards Jesus. And I came to see how Christ is the center of everything. Even the sacraments are, I thought of them as works, things that we're doing for God. But I came to learn that, no, this is God helping us. These are, these are divine gifts. And coming to an understanding of, standing of sanctification helped me see that as a gift, that I, am, I can do nothing good on my own. Right? I don't even exist without God, you know, and getting now to study Thomas Aquinas, it's like that's, he emphasizes the point that even being, being itself is uh, God, it's borrowed from him in, in a way of putting it, but everything is grace, and the sacraments are just concrete, physical ways of God expressing his love to us and helping us in that process of sanctification, even if it doesn't always feel that way. Uh, there's another essay by Lewis on um, religion. He said, we can divide religions, trying not to offend anybody, between thin and thick religions. You know, thin religions, are, a lot of them in the East, they're very intellectual. Thick religions we find a lot in like Africa and Central America where it's very ritual oriented, you know, kind of like soups. And he says that the true religion, it would make sense, would be both thick and thin. Have this theology and philosophy that makes sense, and at the same time be very concrete. And I looked at that, and my Protestant faith was not that way. My Protestant faith was very thin. Yeah. There was not a lot of concreteness to it. But I was finding that in Catholicism. And so uh, I realized that I had to give my assent to the Catholic Church. And so... You had mentioned earlier that you hadn't told your wife any of this stuff. That's right. And so at this time, let's see, we're in our second year. Uh, in the spring of that second year working at the school, 
we take in our first two foster children. We had decided even before we got married that we wanted to adopt. So we're in a home, we take in two foster children, and then my wife decides to stay home. And so here we are with two foster children. Um, we buy a house, and we're working at a private Christian school, and I'm starting to wonder, I wonder if Catholics can work here. You know, I had signed my contract for the, the third year, and um, I go you to the principal. Were you starting to get uncomfortable with some of the things you had to teach, or were you? No, you, no, I was teaching math. Okay, so, so you're, you're, you're pretty clear. Yeah, there. not yeah. a lot of Protestant yep. Catholic difference on mathematics, thankfully. <laughs> uh, geometry is the same as it was. And so I asked the principal, what's the deal about Catholics? And he said, no, we can't have Catholics on staff here. So I realized what that would mean for me if I yeah. went in all the way with the Catholic Church. And I'm explaining this to my wife, and she had a hard time with it, as you can imagine. You know, she hadn't signed on to be married to a Catholic. Oh. She married a Protestant man yeah. and expected it to stay that way. And here we had two foster children. And uh, her main thing, though, and she came up with a lot of the stock objections that I had said earlier, and I was able to answer them. But what she wanted to see was a community of vibrant Catholics, yeah. right? And so we were able to find that, thankfully, a community of vibrant Catholics. And she saw that and she said, okay, that makes sense. And thankfully, she has since come into the Catholic Church, so we're able to go to Mass together. But she, was, she followed me to go to the Catholic Church to begin with. And that was tough, too, because we've got these two very young children being in Mass was very different from being at a Protestant service where the kids are in the, the children's room right. and were able to you know, listen to a sermon or whatever it might be. Um, but I, at one point, I remember sitting in our Protestant church thinking to myself, well, I can be Catholic in my theology and just continue going to the Protestant church. But it hit me at that moment, if I believe Catholicism, and I say that I do, then that means I believe Christ is really present in the Eucharist. And that means the Mass is the single most exciting thing that happens on planet Earth, day in, day out, all the time. And why would I not go there? If I really believe that Christ is present in the Eucharist, why in the world would I stay away? What sort of social pressure could keep me from that? And so we, uh, I went to confession, we had our marriage convalidated because I'd received all the sacraments as right. a child. And Advent of that year, so this is 2007, I got to receive the Eucharist again. You know, so it was a special Advent for me coming, right. uh, the coming of Christ in that way. Um, Your wife was supportive of you making it? And my that wife way? was generally supportive. Yeah. You know, she was starting to see some of the things behind it. The following spring then, it came time again to sign our contracts. And along with the contracts comes along this statement of faith. And it was a lot of the Protestant statements of faith, three of them, as a matter of fact. So I signed, and I knew there were other teachers who didn't agree with all of those because they were other Protestant denominations. So I just included my own vague statement of faith. A small group of board members pulled me in and said, Matt, what's the deal? And I told them, um, I'm convinced of the truth of, the, of Catholicism. And so they were very respectful, but they said, I'm sorry, we can't accept your contract. Right. Um, yeah. And at this time, I'm taking classes in philosophy. I got so turned on to philosophy, and philosophy helped to open that door to me that I'm taking philosophy classes at a nearby college, um, not a Catholic college, but nevertheless, despite some of the sort, almost sort of cynical philosophy that's there, um, I'm still being convinced more and more of the truth and seeing its beauty. Um, and so I lose my job. Thankfully, um, I went ahead and I got my physics certificate because I'm, you know, I had a degree in physics, got certified to teach physics, and there's always a need for physics teachers. So then I got a job teaching physics, and that's what I'm still doing. Um, it, it's interesting that, uh, as you said, you're teaching math. Right. I mean, what difference does it make? But at that Christian school, no, you can't be a Catholic, even though you're teaching a course where that doesn't, the issue never even arrives. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, thankfully, I was able to find a job teaching, teaching physics. Um, and I finished my philosophy degree. And uh, I'm also now working on a Master of Arts in Philosophy through Holy Apostles College and Seminary. They have an online program. And it's 
fantastic. It's, it's just great. Um, also, because I'm realizing that it was some of the sloppy thinking that kept me away from the church, um, I've tried to help people understand and think more critically about things. And so I've actually have a couple of books that are going to be published in the spring, kind of introductions to philosophy, one meant for Catholic teens. Um, I'm looking forward to that through Unroot Books and Media. Great. So um, when I had gone away from the Catholic Church back in college, I had pulled my family with me. Um, thankfully, since then, my mother has come back into the Catholic Church. Um, the children that we took in as foster children, we got to adopt them. And right before we adopted them, we took in two more foster children. Oh, God bless you guys. And so, and we got to adopt them as well. And it, it was tough because we didn't know if we were going to get to keep them or not. Mm. So it was difficult for a long time. But we knew that we couldn't hold back in our love for them. We had to be parents to them. Well. But thankfully, then we have been able to adopt them. Uh, and we've had three biological children since. Uh, <laughs> so it's, we've got, we're up to seven kids. And, uh, and we love it. It's, it's difficult, but it's a blessing. Um, and one of the things that we try to do is share our faith. Um, and we wanted to get the kids ready for Mass each week. So one time Emily went to the people at our church and said, do you know of any places where there's kind of prep each week for the upcoming gospel? You can show the kids on YouTube, something like that. And they said, no, we don't know anything, but why don't you start doing that? So we said, okay, let's give it a shot. I'd already made a YouTube channel. It was mostly apologetics, but I hadn't done anything with it for a long time. And so now we make weekly gospel reflection and uh, reading videos for kids. So that's the, the YouTube oh, channel. Oh, sweet. Yeah. The Mr. D418. Yeah, Mr. D418. All right. Uh, and so you, know, you can go there. And that's, that's our family. Those are our kids. And we have fun doing that each week. Um, and I have a couple other YouTube channels that are more philosophy-oriented. Okay. And there are links to all that stuff on the Mr. D418 page. Um, You're studying philosophy now still. You're, yes. Okay. Uh, would you talk a little bit? We have a little bit of time. Uh, the relationship between philosophy and physics. Uh -huh. uh, it seems that historically there was a natural connection. Right. But it seems that in the 20th century particularly there became a disconnect. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if our world has suffered because of that disconnect. Yeah, to me it seems the popular opinion is that philosophy is something that's not objective. You know, I get this objection a lot. Well, that's just a matter of opinion, isn't it? Because I discuss philosophy with my students from time to time, especially philosophy of science. Right. Uh, and I talk about what philosophy is, you know, ethics, metaphysics, and I try to describe it. And they're like, oh, that's just a matter of opinion, isn't it? And that's one of my pet peeves is this whole fact versus opinion thing. Right. It's not. Every statement is either true or false. Um, but what's happened is because of the success of science, it seems to me that we now come, we've worshipped science. Science has replaced philosophy as the source of objective truth. But it certainly leaves a hole in the heart because yeah. philosophy can't tell, or science can't tell us about what's right and wrong right. objectively. Uh, it can't tell us anything about the meaning of life whether or not there's anything after life. And then people get mixed up because they say, well, there's no scientific evidence for the afterlife. There's no scientific evidence for a deeper meaning. And I think to myself, that's because that's not what science is about. <laughs> there's no way to objectively test something like the meaning of life, you know, or whether or not there is a God. You know, people think science has disproved God. It can't. God is something like the, that is... The Russian science. cosmonaut getting up there and saying, oh, I didn't find God, so he doesn't exist. That's right. Yeah. yeah, you know, we didn't we didn't say that he would find God up there. That's uh, he's the has, wrong experiment. Has becoming Catholic opened you to that connection between philosophy and physics in a way that you hadn't recognized before? Absolutely, yes. Um, because I in Catholicism, I found this really strong philosophical tradition, hmm. and then looking at the history of physics and the history of philosophy and seeing that they have a common root in the Middle Ages, or rather philosophy didn't start in the Middle Ages, but science as we know it today began with the Catholic Church and with the Catholic teachings in the Middle Ages. You know, in order, for, in order for there to be science, we have to have an objective, regular universe that has intelligibility in it. And something that's really baffling 
to scientists, and they'll talk about it if you read the books, the fact that we can describe the universe at all is incredible. The fact that it's intelligible, you know, Einstein said that the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. It's unbelievable that, and not only that it is comprehensible and regular and intelligible, but then there are beings in the world that can understand it. It's just mind blowing. You know, and even people are fascinated to hear that even the Big Bang Theory was invented by a Catholic priest, right. Father George right. Lenature. There's a great book, I, I can't remember the exact name, but I think it was called something like the, uh, you know, the, the Wonderful 13th Century. Uh -huh. And it was written by a Catholic. And it just, we, you, so many of us just assume that the Dark Ages were a time mm -hmm. of great ignorance. But you look back in the 12th and 13th century and you see these great thinkers that are all the foundations for everything we believe today. Right. Was sparked back in that time period and all by Catholics. That's right. Yep. That's right. And a lot of the objections that people bring up today were answered already. People were just not doing our homework to seeing that, oh, these objections have already been answered. I got an email. Megan from San Diego writes, as an evangelical, what was your understanding of, quote, church? And what did that mean for the individual believer? Did you hold to any historic argument for the authority or existence of your church? Honestly, I just hadn't given a lot of thought to it. In my theological studies, I hadn't really gotten to that point to think, what is the church? There was just a vague understanding that the church was just the collection of believers. Everybody who is a Christian is a member of the church. Um, yeah, I, again, I think that you, you pointed out earlier that we have the subconscious assumptions that we don't often examine. Mm -hmm. They're just right. there. Uh, almost as a foundation for everything we believe, and we don't examine them unless they get up in front. And one of those is, amongst non-Catholic Christians, is eh, it doesn't matter what church you belong to. It right. really doesn't matter. As long as you got the Bible and Jesus, you're fine. Right. Yeah. 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 And then discovering what the role of the church is was groundbreaking. And to realize the authority of the church and that the authority of the Spirit is given to the church not necessarily to individuals, but to the church to be able to interpret scriptures authoritatively. As you were saying, that this, this book, the scriptures, and which books are in this book, the scriptures, uh, didn't give the authority to a group of Christians. It was the other way around. The reason we have this book is because of the authority That's right. that the Holy Spirit gave to these men who were gathered in council to decide which of the books should be in it or not. Right. It was the authority of the church. Uh, Chloe from Missouri writes in conversation with a friend the other day, he told me that Catholics added books to the Bible and that I shouldn't be reading them since they aren't the inspired Word of God. I'm confused since I've never really studied this issue before and didn't know what to say. Yeah, well, that was what I thought too for a long time. <laughs> um, but what I found was the same time that those books were added, so to speak, is the same time the New Testament was formed. So if I reject those other books, then by right, I also ought to reject the New Testament. Yep. And so it's either all one or it's none. I remember when I was dealing with that on my journey, one of the things that convinced me to, the, to be open to these other books, as, as Augustine would use in his confession, W-I-S, what, you know, what's yeah. the book of wisdom, right. was that when you compare any time that one of the New Testament authors quotes the Old Testament, and you compare the wording, they're different than our Old Testament. Right. Why is it different? Right. Because the New Testament authors are using a book called this, the translation called the Septuagint. Right, the 70. Which had, which had all the Old Testament books, so, which meant the New Testament authors was using a book that had all the books right. that the Catholic Church would later include in its book. That's right. If they were to go to Mr. D418, they would find what? They would find a gospel reading and reflection for kids. Uh, and so it's a gospel, re it's the gospel reading for the upcoming Sunday. And then a little reflection on it from the kids. Uh, and then of course the outtakes at the end. We include the outtake because I mean, you can only imagine trying to do that with seven kids who come up with all kinds of crazy things that happen. What's the age range of your and kids? So two to 12 right now is the age range of the children. God bless you on that. What a great Thank challenge you. it is uh, to, to accept not only the, the gifts that God gives you through the womb, but the gift that God gives you through tragedy sometime, mm -hmm. right? Uh, yeah. It opens up these wonderful young men and women that need a family, need a father, need a mother, and God has put that in your heart to do that. God bless you, Trent. Right. Thank you. We need it. 
And Matt, thank you for joining us on yeah. the journey home, for sharing your Glad journey to be here. and and uh, sharing your wisdom uh, as a teacher of physics. It's a it's a wonderful. Uh, calling to do that because you have a lot of people today that think there's no connection between science and religion, but there is. That's right. our, it's because they're all created by the one creator That's right. that holds it all together. Thank you, Matt. And thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I do pray that Matt's journey is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you next week.